Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the State of Data Science in Africa series hosted by the National Institutes of Health, the Common Fund. My name is Maggie Dugan and I'm here with my colleagues from No Innovation. We're also known as KI, that's the KI and KaiStorm, the platform you all use to get here today. We are a facilitation team that specializes in running workshops and meetings and events like this to accelerate scientific innovation. Briefly, our agenda today, it's right behind me. We have some welcoming remarks um, with background on the funding opportunity and a few tips that I will give you for maximizing your experience in this webinar. We'll have an overview of today's session on biomedical informatics and data science in Africa from one of our co-moderators. And we'll have a short presentation from each of our panelists, followed by questions and answers from same panelists, and then a plenary conclusion. It's very straightforward. And immediately after the webinar, we will host some interactive topic discussions. These are, by the way, opt-in, so you're not required to attend, but we hope you will join if you're interested in interacting. It's a chance to continue with the panelists, dive deeper, and to network with others who are interested in the same topic of biomedical informatics and data science in Africa. So today's event is associated with an NIH program on harnessing data science for health discovery and innovation in Africa. I'm going to hand it over briefly to Laura Pavlich. She's the program officer at the National Institutes of Health at the Fogarty International Center, and she can tell you a little bit more about it. Thank you, Maggie. Just as a reminder for those of you who are, um, and for those of you who are new to this program, today's event is associated with a new NIH Common Fund program on harnessing data science for health discovery and innovation in Africa. There are four different funding opportunities currently open for applications, and you can learn more at bit.ly forward slash NIH dash DSI Africa. Applications are due starting in late November, and we encourage you to visit the KaiStorm platform to learn more about applying to NIH uh, grants and also to meet and network with potential collaborators. Additionally, contact information is listed on KaiStorm and in each funding opportunity for the appropriate NIH scientific contact, and we encourage you to reach out to us with any questions. I'll hand it back over to Maggie to set up the rest of today's session. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, just wanted to mention here that if you are someone who uses social media um, and you hear something interesting, here's how you can hashtag it. Uh, you can use hashtag DSI Africa, hashtag NIH Africa data, and hashtag no innovation to let people know about what uh, is happening at this session and at any others. So what else? Um, we are recording this session. Um, and you will be able to see a recording of this and share that with other colleagues. Uh, it will be posted on the NIH YouTube channel as well as here. In, uh, on the KStorm, on the KaiStorm platform. It will have captions also, by the way. What else? If you have any technical questions during this program, um, you can always go back to KaiStorm and scroll down to the Need Help page, and there you will be able to find someone who can give you help. You can leave a post-it note, or you can find someone who can give you advice about how to get back here. Um, questions also. During the panel, you may, um, want to be able to ask some questions and you'll see at the bottom of your screen there are little clouds for Q&A and you can write a question there. We invite you if you see a question that someone else has asked and you think yeah I have that question too or that's a really good question I want to see the answer to that please upvote it. That helps us to know which questions have um, the more energy to them and we want to make sure that we answer them. Um, I think that's it. We're a large group um, we don't know that we can answer every single one, but we'll do our best. So with that, let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you today's panel co-moderator. We have two moderators. I'll introduce our first one. Our co-moderator is Gita Sentil. She is the program director for the Office of Genomic Research Coordination at the National Institutes of Mental Health. I take it to you now. Thank you. I would like to uh, follow my uh, co-moderator, my uh, partner on this, Dr. Daryl Hart. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone uh, joining this virtual session. This uh, panel is on biomedical informatics and data sciences in Africa. Um, as you all know, you probably received an email. This is uh, being held under um, the 
an initiative by Common Fund NIH called Harness and Data Science for Health Discovery and Innovation in Africa. And uh, this session in particular will uh, focus on uh, emerging opportunities and challenges on application of data science and informatics technologies in various biomedical domains and, uh, and how do you take those uh, to African um, data science uh, initiatives and programs. So we will in particular highlight some challenges uh, related to data quality standards uh, when mining uh, large-scale data sets. And uh, we have five panelists for this session. Uh, they'll be giving short presentations on uh, various data science topics, including open data science uh, in genomics, uh, application of machine learning methods in epidemiology, disease diagnosis, and natural language processing in public health. Um, I would, um, um, I'll briefly introduce uh, my co-moderator and myself. We, you probably got my bios, uh, but I'll just uh, go over uh, my, uh, Dr. Daryl Hurt is a brand chief for bioinformatics and computational biosciences branch uh, within the Office of Cyber Infrastructure and Computational Biology at an institute of NIH called National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, it's our acronym is NIAG. And I'm a program director in translational genomics and functional genomics, especially human brain molecular profiling portfolio. Uh, um, and I work within the Office of Genomic Research Coordination at National Institute of Mental Health. So I will um, now turn turn this over to our first speaker, Dr. Dr. Abdullah Baneer Diayo. He's a professor and director uh, in the Center of Excellence of Research on Often Diseases at University of Quebec in Montreal, Canada. He's also co-founder co and chief scientist of uh, My Intelligence Machines, a startup inter integrating genomics company um, so it's a company that integrates genomics, bioinformatics, and artificial intelligence. Dr. Diayo has a degree in computer science from McGill University. Uh, he's also a former research associate at Broad Institute of uh, MIT and Harvard. Uh, he has uh, gotten several awards, uh, including the next Einstein Fellowship Awards. It's one of the top African scientists awards. He's currently leading two major projects related to precision uh, uh, health for RAID and infectious diseases. And he's also advisor services and advisor for various science projects and startups in Africa. I uh, will now welcome Dr. Uh, Diaya to present his uh, talk. Thank you, Darrell, for uh, the introduction. And um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, thank you for the invitations. My talk will be uh, advocating the need of open genomics data in Africa, how um, that advocation is going is by presenting example on how we are using genomics data in different areas um, for delivering services. Starting um, quickly at the point, for everyone, the introductions know that for the past 20, 30 years, there are a lot of genomics informations that are captured for different layer in the process of uh, biochemical uh, science. And those elements can be grouped by genes, transcripts, and other annotations are now findable, organized, and accessible within uh, different directories, including the NCBI and Ensemble. Okay, we are in, um, I, I will just continue from here, um, where we have a lot of data coming from NCBI Ensemble and other consortium that helps scientists throughout the world to design multi-omics analysis, including integrations of genomics with or the layer of information using machine learning data science to extract biomarkers that are important in therapeutics. 
So this is a key component towards the discovery of new drugs and it will lead the potential of bringing new drugs in the market and delivering key services in agriculture and other sectors. So uh, that is changing the paradigm in um, how biology is working. And we need to know that all the biologists need to work with data scientists in the coming years because the uh, data need to be integrated within a systems. And when we take a simplified view of uh, how biologists, data scientists, and medical researchers can work toward genomic medicine, Machine learning plays now a central role by turning high throughput measurement into specialized or general, generalized purpose predictive models. So this is really important to discover and assess um, new variation within human genomes that could be associated to health or a mutant disease that could lead to a specific disease. So um, that means we are in the era where we can leverage research that is done in studying genes and genomes to include research with the genomes and help our ability to sequence those genomes to understand the structures. A few later years later, uh, genomes started to be used to better understand living organisms and their disease states. The development of second and third generation sequencing technology is now moving genomics to a next level, which is to analyze genomic data and really use that to improve human health and deliver key services associated to agri-food and and forestry productions. It, it is really important that we figure out, uh, even with this pandemic, one of the key issue on clinical trials for delivering a vaccine is to better segment population that could benefit from a drug and separate those groups from other groups that could be toxic. The drug could be toxic and not beneficial. And deliver the right targets. To identify that, one needs to combine the genomics and all the layers information to better segment how a new drug, a new molecule could affect the pathways related to the immune systems. So this is something that is crucial within the streamline of using genomics and data science within uh, the COVID pandemic crisis. But now we are experiencing a lot of growth of genomic sequence starting uh, an, ex an exponential growth where we can see that in Africa, we have really low spots where we can access a lot of genomics information. This is information of um, sequence coming from uh, metagenomics sampling throughout the world. And there are a lack of data sampling collected from Africa, which is presented here. Even though we have an exponential growth of data collected throughout the world. And how this affects us as a scientist. In my team, we are monitoring HIV mutations and their effects. And with uh, St. Justin Hospital in Quebec, we are monitoring how mutations in um, pregnant uh, of HIV in pregnant women can affect structure of proteins that could lead to um, a resistance. And this is monitored for throughout all the sequence strands of the HIV within the pregnant women. We tried to extend such monitoring in to study African populations with a team in Senegal. And uh, my former postdoc, who is now a professor at the University of Chekanta. And what we realized that there, 
we can afford of selecting several strands of HIV throughout the world coming from open data and from uh, private um, collaborators data. But what we can see, it's difficult to model transmissions networks, to study quasi-species, quasi or to either identify functional annotations associated to some of the strands due to the fact that most of the countries or regions lack a lot of uh, sequencing strand or open virus uh, strands that are sequenced and accessible for analysis. However, what, what one can see from the initial collection data, we can see that there are patterns between the different regions are really different. We can capture the mutations for the important uh, target uh, mutation sites that we are following uh, on those trackers. But to accurately do that tracking, we need to have more and more data. And that is also affecting how people are tracking now the COVID in um, the different uh, region of the world using the next train uh, tools. One can see that there are a lot of data coming throughout several uh, regions in the world, tracking the mutations of eight strands that are, are traveling throughout the world. And we see that we have only small spots coming from Africa. And that could lead, cannot help us to better track in the continent, the transmission dynamics and so on. So there are a lot of other questions that could be addressed by the genomics going from agriculture, uh, livestock. And we call that in my uh, era as genomic informed biovigilance techniques. And this era is a market of $2,000 billion, $2, billion. And I think Africa needs to be a part of this new economical market. Let me just finish by showing a quick example how we are using such data in uh, Quebec states now. I'm leading a project where we um, are improving the dairy sector by helping farmers to predict earlier the replacement of a cow. We are collecting data from the different states uh, real time. And these data are used 1.4 million cows are used to design a predictive model that could help predict the lifetime profit of a cow and help a farmer to decide whether 18 months prior he will inseminate or not a cow, depending on parameters. That is a, a gain of more than $400 million in the dairy sectors. So um, if it is implemented co uh, correctly. So I mean, those kind of studies, those kind of services are really important in uh, the development in Africa. However, to do that, we need to have the data that are used in a smart tech technologies and to have the smart policies that are coming to guide the usage of those data. And also these data need to be um, under the FAIR principle if we want them to be collaborative, accessible, and if we want the research to be reproducible. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Abdullah. I very much enjoyed your, your presentation and um, particularly the idea of genomics as a service. Uh, I, I think we'll hear perhaps more about uh, the scaling that I think you were referring to as we go through the rest of our presentations. Thank you. There was a, uh, um, we've gotten some questions in the chat and we'll try to respond to them, but trying to stay on time, we're going to now uh, move to hear from uh, Elaine uh, and Soisi. And uh, Elaine is uh, coming to us from uh, Boston um, uh, University School of Public Health. 
and she has a PhD in computational epidemiology, master's in statistics, and her research is focused on uh, digital data and technology to improve health in communities globally. Her work is also focused on addressing bias in digital data and understanding factors influencing disparities in health incomes. Outcomes, not incomes. <laughs> She's on the advisory boards of Data Science Africa and Data Science Nigeria. She's also the founder of Rete, which is an initiative focused on providing scientific writing tools and resources to student communities in Africa in order to increase representation in scientific publications. Elaine, we welcome you and look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Daryl. Today, I'm going to talk to you about digital epidemiology, which is what most of my work is focused on. So if you think about epidemiology as a study of the patterns of disease, injury, and health, and drivers of these patterns in specific populations, then digital epidemiology is basically the same thing, but it tends to focus more on non-traditional data sources, um, most of the time digital data sources. So an example would be having two kids who have flu-like symptoms and then the parent trying to figure out whether they actually have the flu or they have COVID. And so they might go to Google to look up information. So this data can be useful at an individual level, but it's also very useful at a population level because we can look at what is happening in a specific population. And there's been quite a few studies to show that this kind of information tracks with actual um, reports of disease in different locations. So a lot of digital epidemiology at the beginning was focused on trying to see how digital tools can reduce the time between when we have outbreaks and when those outbreaks get reported to the public. So if you think of traditional public health surveillance in this, um, in this way where someone gets infected with, it could be a new disease or it could be something we've seen before, and then they go to the hospital, talk to healthcare workers, who then decide this person needs to get tested. And so they get tested, that information is supported to local officials. Then local officials will share this information with the Ministry of Health, and if it's a disease of, of importance, let's say Ebola, or it's a novel uh, pathogen like the COVID. Um, and then that information gets sent to the WHO. So before this used to take quite a lot of time, it could take weeks before that information reaches the WHO. But with advances in technology, we see that this information gets shared a lot faster and the public can know that things are happening in different sections, parts of the world a lot sooner than we used to know in the past. And this is what digital epidemiology used to, or digital disease surveillance used to focus on a lot in the beginning. Um, but now the focus has shifted to looking at how this data can be used in surveillance in different populations. So the goal is not to replace traditional surveillance systems, but rather to supplement those systems. So we want to help systems work better. So here are examples of some data sources that I've used in my research. Crowdsourcing, where people opt in and share information about symptoms or disease in their communities. Um, Jeffrey has done a lot of work in this area, so he could be a good person to give some examples. Um, we use a lot of search data, data from Google, where we look at what people are searching for and how that can inform health in different populations. Social media data, um, so from places like Twitter, Instagram, can tell us about people's interests, can tell us about people's behavior. So this is a lot of behavioral data. But then there's also remote sensing data, which is not health data, but it, it is place data. And it can tell us about the environment and it can tell us how environments can be linked to health outcomes and think more broadly about the different things around us that influence health. And I think Abdullah is going, no, Mustafa is going to mention um, some of the work that they've done in this space. There's also news data. So an example is Health Map, which is an international or global disease surveillance platform. The mine news reports and put it on one in one place where you can actually go and see what outbreaks have been reported in your region. And then we have internet forums where people talk about everything from disease to treatments and how treatments are affecting them that can all tell us about health and disease in different populations. So an estimated 
200 or 268 million people in Africa used the internet in 2018. Um, that's a lot of people and they're using the internet for different purposes. But currently there are more than 200 million active social media users in sub-Saharan Africa. What that means is that people are producing data, whether it's seeking information on health um, related issues or sharing information on health related issues, your data, there's data that's being produced, um, produced on different platforms and this data can inform us about health on the continent. But in order for us to adopt digital platforms for public health surveillance in Africa, we need to think about the challenges that are unique to this context. So what I mean here is that we can't just take what has worked in the West and assume that it's going to work in, on the African continent as well. We have to think about what are the cultural differences, what are social differences, and how can we incorporate that into the models that we build. So here's an example where we looked at now casting influenza like illness in Cameroon, which basically means we're trying to, to forecast the present um, trends in influenza like illness in Cameroon. And so on one side you have a plot where you have percent ILI on the Y axis and date on the X axis. And this shows you our model estimate of influenza like illness in Cameroon and confidence intervals around our estimates. So our estimates were basically overlapped with the actual data that we got from the Ministry of Health. And to get this, we obtained search data for influenza symptoms, treatments, natural traditional remedies, as well as searches for high burden diseases such as AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, where we, we, we were thinking about like, what would my aunt search for if she had the flu? Or what would my grandmother search for if she had access to a computer and wanted to look up symptoms? And what we found was that by focusing on natural traditional remedies, we were actually able to produce models that tracked very well with influenza like illness in Cameroon. So on the other side, you have several different models that we compare. We have um, support vector machine regression at the top, random forest, multivariable regression models, and then we have autoregressive uh, time series models where we're basically saying that, given that what we've seen in the past on the ILI, can we predict what it would look like in the next time step? Um, and what worked best was support vector machine and random forest in this case. So these are very simple methods, methods that most people learn when they just start doing data science, but We've shown that they were very useful in this particular case if we just want to track how influenza like illness is, what are the trends in Cameroon. And the main message for this is that context matters. So if we're going to develop models using digital data, we need to think very carefully about context. Um, another area that we've been looking at is chronic diseases. So there's been a lot of conversation and around what would happen in the next 20, 30 years in terms of the prevalence of chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, and risk factors like obesity and overweight in, on the African continent. So this is just a map of what this currently looks like or what it looked like in 2016. You can see that a lot of the higher prevalence are in the North and in Southern Africa. But Africa is the most, um, is a continent with the highest urbanizing rate, which means that, uh, in, in the next several years, the United Nations actually estimate that by 2050, 56% of people in Africa will live in cities. And so if you start thinking about urban areas globally, you see that these are areas that tend to have higher prevalence of chronic diseases. And there's an expectation that that will also happen on the African continent. So we're starting to think about behavioral data. We know that this data is available from um, internet platforms, from social media sites, how can we use the data to start thinking about behavior in, in countries in Africa and track this over time to hopefully give us more information about the prevalence of risk factors. So these are the countries that have the highest um, overweight and obesity prevalence on the continent. So if you look at the countries in North Africa, there's very, there's similarity in what people are searching for. So this is search terms, you have yoga, gene, exercise, um, then if you look at Egypt, you have gym, breakfast, yoga. So there's a repetition. But then when you go to places like South Africa, you start seeing some differences, like how to exercise, green tea, weight gain. And when I shared these with my colleagues in South Africa, they said they actually a lot more terms that I should be looking at. At the time, we had about 100 terms. Um, and they said there's a lot more that we should be looking at. And we should be thinking a lot about context, because even though there might be some similarities across countries, 
different countries think about health differently and you would see different patterns in what people are searching for. And so when we looked at how the search is correlated with obesity and overweight prevalence, we could see that there were very strong correlations across the continent by just looking at what people were searching for. So the idea is if we can look at risk factors for chronic diseases, which include things like um, unhealthy diets, physical inactivity, smoking, alcohol abuse, this kind of data can inform us about what's happening in the continent and can hopefully supplement surveys that sometimes take years for us to see um, data from. And of course, there are challenges. Um, a shortage of high quality surveillance data is one of them. And I think this actually opens opportunities for thinking about these alternative data sources and how they can be used to supplement um, situations in which we don't have really good surveillance data. We should also think about cultural influences, as I've mentioned, there's socioeconomic and inequalities and representation. So not everyone is going to be on these platforms because not everyone has the money to be spending time on, on Facebook or um, Twitter or have the resources that they need to, to be on those platforms. So representation is very important. And then obviously the ethical challenges. So how do we make sure that the, the products that are coming out of these data sets are not exacerbating existing health inequalities but are actually helping people? And how do we also use this data in a way that people are informed on how it's being used? Um, so here are some recommendations in terms of addressing this, these challenges. So digital literacy education, I think, is one that's very important. And we've seen these highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic as a lot of people buy into misinformation. Um, so I, I don't think it's something that it's only in Africa, but it's all over the world. So I think digital literacy is very important. Educating children as young as possible to understand that everything they see on the internet is not true. Um, design of appropriate consent system is also important so that people understand how their data is being used. Um, methods that address a, la a lack of demographic representation is also extremely important. So I want to acknowledge all the people that are working with me on those projects and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lynn, for an excellent presentation. Uh, it was a fascinating talk and we learned a lot about digital epidemiology. And now it's time to move to our next speaker, Jeffrey Sewell. Dr. Sewell is, um, he is an assistant research professor in Center for Research Computing and Eck Institute for Global Health, University of Notre Dame, USA. His research interests range from computational biology, network science, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. Um, his uh, doctor C was a team leader at IBM Research Africa before uh, he joined Notre Dame. Um, he well, worked in South Africa and, and he also was at, a, at IBM TJ Watson Research Center in New York. He was a postdoc at Dartmouth and University of Pennsylvania, received a PhD from the University of Notre Dame. He led a lot of publications, patterns, international awards, media coverage, startups. So we uh, welcome Dr. Sivo to give his talk on fundamental biology to public health and the science of science with natural language processing. Welcome, Dr. Sivo. Thank you, Gita, for uh, the introduction and thank you everyone for uh, coming. So, <clears throat> One of the key challenges in biomedical data science, especially in Africa, is lack of data. So today I will discuss how the exponential growth of nucleic acid sequences and biomedical literature, combined with advances in natural language processing, could transform fundamental biology, public health, and even how we do uh, science. And natural language processing is basically teaching computers to read, uh, to read the text, to understand human language. So I believe that the exponential growth of, uh, of uh, genome sequence data is a particularly important opportunity for how we do research on fundamental biology. And I think natural language processing has a very important role to play uh, in this. 
Over the last few decades, there has been a tremendous decrease in the cost of genome sequencing. And this is enabling uh, a very rapid rise of openly available genome sequence uh, data. There are at least two important features of geno genome sequence data that make them particularly amenable to natural language processing. And one is that genome sequence data, whether DNA or RNA, are very symbolic in nature. So we have an alphabet of A, G, C, uh, T, where A stands for, uh, uh, for the DNA base uh, adenine. And so it is more than just a, just a letter. It represents a lot of information. And this is also the same of language because we use language to communicate very complex uh, things about the world. The other important feature about uh, genome sequence data is actually that scientists have used several language-like uh, metaphorical terms when referring to DNA. So we talk of sequence, we talk of a message, we talk of a code, we talk of translation, and even now we talk of editing uh, DNA. And all of these factors make uh, genome sequence data very amenable to processing by natural language uh, processing. So one of the key questions that we've been interested in is that can we learn something very fundamental about the DNA of all organisms on Earth based on, uh, based on their sequences? And we've been exploring how to apply natural language processing to address some of these uh, questions. One particular approach we've used, which is borrowed from recent advances in natural language processing that rely on word embedding. And word embedding basically uh, is a way of developing uh, a vector representation of, uh, of words in a way that relationship between words in vector space captures uh, their semantic, uh, sem semantic relations. And this approach came out of uh, uh, Google Labs by uh, Mikolov. And so we've been applying this approach uh, to genome sequence data in public uh, databases, including uh, thousands of microbiome genome uh, sequences obtained across the world uh, in different populations, as well as from environmental sequence uh, uh, data. And basically with this data, we're able to train uh, neural networks that begin to capture the relationship between short subsequences of DNA as a means to understand whether there's some hidden grammar within DNA sequences of all organisms. And so I'll just share one of the key important things that we learn. So by applying this approach to DNA without any, uh, any particular constraints on how we apply the approach, one of the amazing things that we find is that there's, uh, there's a concerned pattern across all DNA sequences uh, of sequenced organisms uh, that basically shows that, uh, uh, that trinucleotides, uh, so combinations of three DNA uh, letters, uh, have this special relationship where uh, trinucleotides that share the same context across genomes uh, also code for amino acids that uh, uh, emerged uh, at different times in uh, the evolution of life on Earth. So in particular, we find that uh, trinucleotides or codons that code for very ancient amino acids. So these are amino acids that are thought to have formed in the prebiotic uh, world. Uh, we find that such amino acids uh, have uh, trinucleotides that share similar contexts across uh, different uh, genomes. And what this tells us basically is that in the genome sequence of uh, uh, organisms today, uh, there's evidence for, uh, for the past. And that evidence for the past might actually go up to the beginning of the very early genes and genomes. So next I'll switch gears to show another example of how natural language processing can uh, enhance uh, public, uh, public health. And in particular, we've been interested in understanding whether we can use the DNA sequences uh, or the genome sequences of uh, viruses uh, across various species to predict which of those viruses might uh, emerge into human populations. So a good example is that could we have predicted the emergence of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 
based on the DNA sequence of, uh, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus alongside other viruses uh, circulating in the wild. And there are millions of such viruses uh, in different animal uh, species. So we organized a hackathon uh, that we named the Deep Viral Code uh, Hackathon in collaboration with the Deep Learning uh, Indaba X uh, machine learning uh, meeting in South Africa. Uh, and basically we challenged data scientists, many of whom have never worked with uh, biological data sites. We challenged them to uh, consider DNA sequences as, uh, as text and apply their natural language processing skills uh, to this data set to see whether they could predict whether a virus is zoonotic or non-zoonotic uh, based on the DNA uh, sequence. And one of the key things we learned from uh, this hackathon is that uh, certain deep learning models were actually able to uh, pr uh, predict very well which virus uh, could be potentially zoonotic versus those that are non-zoonotic. Uh, so finally, I want to switch on uh, to another kind of opportunity uh, for biomedical science uh, combined with the natural language uh, processing. And this opportunity lies in the fact that biologic, biomedical literature has been uh, growing exponentially. Uh, so today, there are millions of papers that are published in any one year. We are also seeing an increasing uh, amount of sharing uh, of, uh, of, of preprints. And all of this is allowing us to take a peek at science uh, globally in a way that has not been possible uh, before. So we have been particularly interested uh, in applying natural language processing to the field of gene editing uh, using CRISPR uh, Cas uh, enzymes. And the reason we are interested in this is that we are still in the early days of this, uh, uh, this technology that could change the way uh, uh, the way we perform biomedical, uh, biomedical research. Uh, and so uh, we've been looking at uh, publications in, uh, in PubMed uh, and applying uh, different natural language processing methods to extract different elements uh, from published papers on, uh, on CRISPR. And the idea is that we want to take the entire CRISPR field and basically map out all the genes, the diseases, the species, as well as the researchers involved uh, in, uh, in gene editing research as a means of understanding uh, the progress of research in this area, but also as a means of identifying uh, the gaps that need to be filled uh, in this uh, growing area. And so just to give an example, uh, last year we performed uh, an analysis for Science Magazine uh, when they were doing a story on uh, the rise of CRISPR research in, uh, in China. Uh, and basically, by looking at the entire CRISPR literature using uh, natural language processing, we're able to see uh, the contribution of different countries in this uh, emerging uh, technology. Now, I think this is very important, especially for Africa, because we see that there is a, a huge dominance of both the US and China uh, in CRISPR research. So we need to ask ourselves, what does this mean? for the future of this technology in the biomedical, uh, biomedical field. Uh, we also see a lot of disparities uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, gender. So we see that most of the published studies in CRISPR uh, are led by uh, male uh, PIs. So what does this mean uh, for the development of CRISPR technologies uh, uh, as equitable uh, technologies for, uh, for, human, uh, for human health? And we've also been monitoring uh, the funding mechanisms uh, behind uh, ongoing uh, uh, CRISPR research. And we hope that this can uh, direct future investments uh, in CRISPR uh, research. Uh, so finally, I just want to note that for the last 30 uh, or so years, the National Library of Medicine has created uh, wonderful resources that are allowing sharing of vast amounts of genomic data as well as biomedical uh, literature. Uh, I believe that to harness the full power of these resources, uh, natural language processing is needed. And I think that because these resources are freely accessible, it's an opportunity uh, for everyone in the world, uh, including Africa, where there might be lack of data sets to contribute to the advancement of biomedical uh, research. And, uh, 
I want to thank uh, the many people who have contributed in different ways to uh, this work. So one of my students, Kevin Michael at University uh, of Notre Dame, as well as uh, collaborations with IBM Research Africa uh, and funding by the National Science Foundation and an IBM faculty award. Thank you. Fantastic, Jeffrey. I really uh, love the innovative uh, application of NLP to genomic data. Uh, I think that that uh, really captures kind of the, the spirit of our session today. Uh, I'd like to uh, remind and invite uh, the attendees of our seminar today that we have the Q&A feature. And we invite you to continue to add your questions there and even to upvote those questions that you think are most interesting or that need to be uh, addressed. We will have a Q&A session. Um, we are a few minutes behind, but the Q&A session is, uh, will, be, uh, will be lengthy. And then we'll also have these breakout sessions later where we can continue the Q&A. So there should be plenty of time to ask and respond to these questions, but please do keep uh, sending in your questions through the the Q&A feature. Our next speaker is uh, Dina Machuv, and uh, she is coming to us from the uh, Nelson Mandela African Institution of Science and Technology in Arusha, Tanzania. Uh, her research focuses on developing data-driven solutions in agriculture, and she is currently looking at developing poultry disease diagnostic tools using computer vision and bioinformatics methods. Uh, she also has a role on uh, various organizations for data science uh, on the continent. So Dina, we welcome you and uh, look forward to your remarks. Uh, thank you, Daryl. I'm thankful to be here. And uh, today I will talk about the uh, practical application of machine learning uh, to solve uh, challenges in the poultry sector. And um, so the application of data science for poultry diseases diagnostics. Um, Tanzania in uh, East Africa ranks third among African countries uh, for in terms of total livestock numbers. But the country has very low productivity and this is uh, due to diseases and we lack data on the sector. It is an important sector because more than 4.6 million households uh, rely on poultry for food as a source of food and also income. So if we are able to address the challenge on uh, poultry diseases, uh, we'll definitely, are, we, pro we have the opportunity to address the second uh, sustainable development goal uh, on uh, zero hunger. Currently, the chicken diseases of uh, Salmonella, Newcastle and Cox diosis um, are diagnosed using lab procedures. And um, I would like to emphasize on Salmonella because it's zoonotic and um, really it causes typhoid to humans. And um, the, the lab procedures alone take up to three, four days to get results. That's normally done using PCR. And also a majority of farmers rely as well on clinical signs. And access to these lab procedures are equally expensive and um, they are limitedly available. So it really calls for rapid diagnostics procedures to enable farmers and livestock offices in the field to, to, to address the challenges on diagnosing these diseases. So this provides an opportunity uh, for data scientists uh, to address these challenges in the livestock sector, uh, where data science tools have the opportunity to provide farmers with tools that they can provide that will be will reduce the diagnostics time from four days to up to three minutes and uh, enable farmers to to make the right decisions uh, such as isolating the sick chickens to prevent further spread of the disease and also um, avoiding the economic loss uh, in a timely manner. 
So we really see the suitable data set being images because in Africa, uh, we have uh, low levels of literacy in multiple languages. So image data is really a better data set in developing countries. Also, we have um, the ubiquity of mobile phones. Uh, we, in the continent, we have about 250 million uh, people with smart phones. So mobile phones really are provide the opportunity of being a sensor in such venture on diagnostics. So how we apply this on this ongoing project, we have a workflow that has about four steps. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done on collecting the data on the field before machine learning and data science can come into place. So um, our task is really to develop a model that can correctly classify images for chicken diseases. And um, here, so we want to, after we have the model, we are able to diagnose and label the right, the right diseases for coccidiosis, salmonella, and whether the chickens are healthy. So this is the data set that we're currently are working on. This is the chicken droppings. And this is a sample of how they look like for healthy chickens and for coccidiosis and as well as um, uh, salmonella. Uh, and, um, we, we have a target of, um, of uh, reaching up to, to, to 8,000 images and currently we are at, um, we are at 2,800 uh, images. So after we have collected the data, we will do the modeling using convolutional neural networks. And um, convolutional neural networks provide a relatively automated way of extracting different features uh, from the image. And, um, at, and this happens on the hidden layers. At every layer, the network discovers a new representation of the input and uh, at the output, uh, when the new, at, the, at the output, we are able to, to make a decision whether the chicken is healthy or diseased. And the label will equally include the, what type of disease. And the, the data set, the raw data set is the, is the chicken droppings uh, images. So uh, we equally envision to, to deploy the developed model into a mobile application so that farmers can, farmers as well as uh, livestock officers can have a tool on the field to be able to rapidly diagnose uh, the diseases. It is our vision on this project that will have the, the will be able to have um, an end to end tool for early diagnosis detection of the three uh, chicken diseases, coccidiosis, salmonella, and Newcastle, and also produce a machine learning data sets uh, to be shared with the larger AI community for further research in the field. And um, we really equally envision that farmers using this app will have uh, reduced uh, outbreaks of, um, of the diseases. Thank you. Um, this was a fascinating talk. Um, it's delightful to learn about how machine learning methods are used um, to classify images. And uh, I can see how this can be translated to other areas as well. So we will now move to our final speaker. He, Dr. Mustafa Sise is a research scientist and head of Google AI Center in Accra, Ghana. Um, Dr. Sise is a, uh, he, his interests are in AI uh, algorithmic development and his, um, he is involved in uh, developing axiological artificial intelligence methods, particularly um, and then he's also, his research efforts focus on fairness, transparency, and reliability of making these methods and data globals. Prior to becoming the head of Google's AI Center, Dr. Cisse worked at Facebook, artificial intelligence in Paris. And uh, he is originally from Senegal and uh, he did 
so study in mathematics and physics in, and received a master's in machine learning and PhD in computer science from uh, Marie Curie's uh, University of Marie Curie in Paris, France. I uh, will now turn this over to Dr. Cisse to in, uh, talk about improve, improving lives with machine learning. Welcome, Dr. Cisse. So thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, inviting me. Um, I um, looked at the uh, previous presentations with a lot of interest. Uh, this is a great and timely event in Africa at this moment. So thank you very much. I wanted to, uh, to talk about what is going on, uh, the various applications of machine learning currently uh, targeted specifically at improving lives and in particular in Africa. So uh, this is very important because machine learning and especially computer vision has made significant progress in the past years. So we went from achieving only 20, achieving 26% errors on the standard benchmark in 2011 to having a superhuman performance and recognition benchmarks starting 2016. And we have now even better models. Now, some of these technology can be used to solve uh, some of the most important and pressing challenges of our time. And this has sparked an important wave of um, interest into various areas of machine learning research. And this is exemplified by um, one of the signals is the number of papers uploaded on a daily basis on archive. So as, as much as uh, as many as 90 new papers on machine learning every single day. Uh, this, is, this can be uh, safely called an exponential growth of the field. Now, all this technology that is being developed is being used currently to solve important challenges, as I said before. Um, so in 2008, 2008, the National Academy of Engineering of the United States published uh, a list of, of the grand challenges of the 21st century. And as you can see, machine learning is being used to, in certain cases, accelerate the discoveries in some of these challenges. In other, other cases, really as one of the main tools um, to make progress in these fields. And at Google, for example, we have been looking into all the fields that are listed in red here. The issue, um, the issue with machine learning is that even though it's an important technology, the experts working in this field are not distributed evenly across the different geographic locations of this planet. So a few years ago, a company called Element AI sitting in Canada did a survey of the machine learning engineers and researchers to find out where those people are, where do they work? Because this is an important question as it defines to some extent the questions and challenges they decide to address and also the immediate environmental impact they have because one cannot detach research questions from the environment in which that research is being done. And their findings are quite telling. From this map, and I'm sure you've seen a similar map in other um, situations, from this map, we can clearly see that most of the machine learning researchers and engineers in the world are in either in uh, North America or in Europe or to some extent in China, Japan, Australia, or India. The communities of machine learning researchers, as uh, surveyed by the study of Element AI folks, is very scarce within Africa. I want, in this talk, to challenge a little bit this idea, because as scarce as this community is, it is growing extremely fast, and it is it has a huge potential for impact, as has been discussed before by Dina, for example, whose work in the, the context of DSA, and, but also in Tanzania, I would like to commend here, but also uh, by Elaine and Abdullah and Jeffrey and all the others. So this is important because we live in a company which will be populated by 2.4 billion people by 2050. And these people will represent 40% of the uh, 
world's population in the in working age uh, world's population. So making sure that whatever technology we develop has a positive impact on these people is critical. And this is, uh, this is the work that is being tackled by several groups across the continent, also including uh, the group, the research team um, I worked with uh, at Google. So I wanted to, to start with, uh, with this application, which is uh, how do we use AI to improve agriculture? Uh, so in many places in Africa, uh, having healthy crops is a matter of food security. A significant part of the population relies on, the, on agriculture for income, for their own living, etc. Uh, so when it's about humans, when you talk about health for humans, we can have doctors who diagnose humans maybe early in order to take the right treatment. But how about plants? This is an important uh, topic that is not enough discussed enough. So um, in Central and East Africa, for example, if you consider cassava, which is an important, uh, one of the most important uh, crops there. So it is plagued often with some, some diseases. And if we can diagnose these diseases early using a technology that is affordable, that is accessible to the farmers, uh, we can take action early and therefore this can prevent uh, 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 significant losses of, of, of the crops. So um, a team of folks, a uh, team of researchers led by Dr. Ernest Mwebaze, who is from Uganda, but who is, uh, who is working in, in the team uh, at Google AI, developed a technology to, to perform crop disease diagnosis using cutting edge um, research uh, tech and, and technology built in the lab uh, in computer vision. To, 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 to build uh, a software that can be deployed on low-end mobile devices so that it can run offline and that farmers can use uh, in, in their smartphones to take snapshots and pictures of their, uh, their crops, their uh, the leaves, and then get uh, an instant diagnosis of the plants. Another important aspect is how do we use machine learning and computer vision in order to improve our understanding of, uh, of the populations? Now, this is an important question. Elaine talked about computational epidemiology, and this is a potential source of data for understanding how the populations evolve, uh, where to build new hospitals, uh, which populations are at risk, etc. So one way of doing this is to analyze satellite imagery. Uh, so if we can look at the cities, African cities and, and other parts of the continent from uh, the perspective of satellite images, we can gain a lot of insights into where people live, how many people live there, etc. Some countries uh, like DRC, for example, have not conducted a census, a proper census for 40 years, for example. Uh, so it is very important to know how many people live in certain areas and where do they live. Uh, you know, to make certain decisions regarding policy. But African cities are very diverse, um, I, as diverse actually as the population of Africa, arguably the most diverse population on the planet as far as the different continents are, are concerned. And this makes uh, the analysis of satellite imagery um, more challenging uh, if we want to know where buildings are, etc. So, for example, if you look at this, uh, uh, this view of the Makoko, which is a slum on the water in Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, can you guess how many people live here? I think this is a challenging question. Or if you look at the high density area in Kampala, uh, can you uh, guess how many people are here? This is also very challenging. Now, all of these, uh, these cities that you've seen or these images that you've seen uh, can be converted into digital maps, just as when you use Google Maps. But when the algorithms that convert the satellite imagery to the maps are not accurate enough, you end up having maps that are uh, pretty empty. So you don't see the buildings on them. If you want to conduct any analysis or any study based on these maps, 
you will not be using a reliable information because you don't know where the buildings are, even though we saw in the previous images uh, that there are many buildings in the map they are lacking. Now, as you can see, the satellite imagery corresponding image corresponding to the previous uh, map image is here and there are a lot of buildings and there are a lot of people. So uh, we've been working uh, in, with, uh, uh, within the lab, a team led by John Quinn, to build improved image segmentation uh, models that can, that can find the different buildings that are in a map, in a, uh, in a, in a satellite image, and then therefore uh, get a better insight into where people live when applied across the continent. So one last application I want to talk about, which has huge potential as well to improve people's life on the continent and which have been developed at Google AI by teams sitting across the world, uh, especially in Mountain View, uh, is how can we use uh, machine learning and computer vision to advance health informatics, in particular to solve diabetic retinopathy. So diabetic retinopathy is the fastest growing cause of blindness. And in particular, if we consider um, Northern Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, by 2040, we will have a total of over 100 million people suffering from diabetic retinopathy. Now, the issue with diabetic retinopathy is that it is a, it is a disease that we, can, we know the current state um, of uh, medical research allows to solve if it is diagnosed early. The problem is that 45% of the patients suffer vision loss before diagnosis, and this number is reported in a, in a study conducted in India, for example. There is a huge shortage of ophthalmologists in many parts of the world, and Africa is no exception to this. If we can automate um, the diagnosis of this condition, many people, a significant number of people, will not uh, lose their vision just due to the lack of uh, diagnosis. Now, how can this be done? One way is just to mimic the way the ophthalmologists do it, which is by looking into retinal fundus images uh, and, and collecting many images uh, by having them labeled as no diabetic retinopathy or proliferative diabetic retinopathy and all uh, the, the, the spectrum uh, between those two extreme cases by expert ophthalmologists. And once that is done, one can train a deep neural network in order to recognize or in order to predict whether a given image corresponds to a patient who is developing a di diabetic retinopathy, who is at risk or not. Now, what the teams of scientists at Google and other uh, institutions have done is to train such models on large amounts of data. And what they found is that the resulting model can achieve a score in terms of accuracy, which is to the very least on par with the, with the average ophthalmologist but very often um, which uh, competes favorably with the expert ophthalmologist. Now, all these applications that I've talked about are just examples of what we can do. But one thing that is very important uh, is that whether it's data science or machine learning or artificial intelligence, whatever you call that technology, will realize its full potential in positively impact people's life only if the populations have the knowledge to solve their own problems because they know the, their challenges, the challenges they face on a daily basis better than anyone. And uh, because of this, we created the African Masters of Machine Intelligence at the African Institute of Mathematical Science, which is the first graduate program in machine intelligence on the continent. We've already uh, graduated close to 100 students in the past two years. And those students are working in the continent and elsewhere to solving some of the most pressing challenges that we have. Um, you can find more information about this online. It's, a, it's a, 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 an extremely selective program and we're trying to make it accessible to more people. 
Um, there is a lot to do, of course, in order to harness data science uh, to improve um, the health of people and livestock and, and plants in Africa. There's a long road ahead, but uh, I believe after watching all these presentations that the future is exciting. Thank you very much. Wow. That's, uh, that's fantastic, uh, Mustafa. Thank you so much for um, your, your, your kind of uh, survey and uh, of course the, <clears throat> the examples that you've given. I thought that uh, we've had a, a great diversity of application of machine learning and data science to uh, different aspects of health and uh, well-being as well as basic uh, research and biomedical uh, informatics, which is again, the, the, the topic of our session. We've gone a little bit over and we're going to have our Q&A session. We'll still conclude at 10.30, uh, but for our Q&A session, first of all, I'd like to thank the audience for all of the questions that they've um, contributed over the course of our discussion here today. And, um, what I'd like to do is maybe just kind of pose some of those questions to, the, to our panelists. Uh, I think uh, the, the question that has been upvoted the most is, is that um, it's important to have access to clinical data. How can we get access to clinical data for data science uh, in Africa? Any thoughts? So Geoffrey, I'll give uh some thoughts. So I think, I think when it comes to clinical data, uh, there has been, of course, some uh, uh, traditional ways of uh, clinicians collecting, uh, collecting data, which is normally through notes. Uh, and I think this is an area that uh, is a great opportunity for uh, data science. Uh, because with clinical notes, uh, you, could, uh, you could digitize them. And uh, once you digitize them, then you could apply approaches like uh, natural language processing uh, to uh, extract information uh, uh, for research. Uh, and I've been involved in uh, uh, one kind of that research uh, when I was uh, at IBM Research uh, Africa Lab in South Africa. So we worked with uh, the National Cancer Registry uh, in uh, South Africa uh, to explore how pathology reports, which are basically uh, written notes by a doctor describing uh, a cancer uh, patient's uh, case. Uh, and basically, we were able to develop uh, natural language processing techniques that could go through these uh, uh, pathology reports uh, and uh, extract more detailed information uh, from those uh, uh, from those reports, uh, which are just uh, text at the end of the day. Uh, so I think importantly, you need collaborations. In our case, we collaborated with uh, the National Cancer Registry, and uh, uh, in any given African country, there are Ministry of Health that perhaps could be uh, uh, very important partners in trying to gain access to the clinical uh, clinical data. Jeffrey, thank you for that. I, I agree that natural language processing is an important part of uh, reading the phenotypic or the clinical information, uh, and there's lots of challenges there. I want to make sure that uh, there were also questions asked specifically um, uh, to Dina, talking about uh, your research and the application. Uh, are you using a, a a CNN architecture uh, tool, or, or are you developing something, or are you using an existing architecture to develop the model? If so, which one are you using? Okay, yeah, we are, we are using existing uh, CNN architectures, and uh, we've started the, the initial training uh, of the images using uh, transfer learning since our goal is deployment into the field. So we are doing currently training on mobile nets 
exception net and BGG uh, and ResNet model was, but since our goal is deployment of the model onto mobile phones, so we, we are going to, to, to continue training and uh, deploy using the exception net. Uh, since we still have little data, we're still training, but uh, those are the transfer, transfer learning models that we're using. Fantastic. Gita, do you have a question that you've identified maybe for our panelists? Yeah, there, were, uh, there was a question uh, for Dina and also for Mustafa. I was wondering if um, both of you, for Dina, the question is, what challenges have you faced in implementing your solution? Um, for, uh, and how easily can it be adapted to other livestock? And Mustafa, um, they're asking, could you please talk about the potential for, uh, for AI to address public health risk related to environmental pollution in urban areas of Africa? These are for you. Okay. okay. Uh, Mustafa, are you going first? Thank you, Dina. Uh, feel free to answer first if you would like to. Um, Okay, yeah, so, so initially the challenges that we really face uh, is uh, building trust with farmers. Uh, so so it re when we do, because we're collecting data at the farms, so it really takes time to build trust with farmers that the solution will directly benefit them. Uh, however, when we visit these farms, we are normally accompanied with livestock officers and vets so we really take time uh, to, to explain about the, the, the research and the expected uh, solution. So to address this challenge, we are, we are preparing ourselves that after we have the tool in our hands, we'll, we'll have a lot of uh, workshops and seminars with these farmers to educate them so that we are, the tool is easily adopted. However, we see the livestock officers being the early adopters of this solution. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to offer some thoughts uh, regarding the question that was addressed to me. Um, I think an important point generally when working on this continent to keep in mind is how does the technological solution fit within the broader uh, solution. I think most of the problems that we're tackling here, including um, in healthcare and in, um, you know, preserving uh, livestock or looking into environmental impact into health, do not only call for a technological solution. We need to, to be very humble in this uh, regard and see how the, in, the technology that we build, and in this case, machine learning or artificial intelligence, how can it be used either to accelerate um, the, the solution that is developed collectively by the different stakeholders or to enable solutions that would not have been possible otherwise. Now, to be more precise, uh, as far as uh, health risks uh, related to environments are concerned, uh, one, one avenue I see where machine learning and AI could have a huge impact is in surveillance, for example, because cities grow extremely quickly, slums developed extremely quickly. Sometimes in areas of conflicts, for example, in a matter of two weeks, you can see a whole new city uh, with hundreds of thousands of people just just appear out of nowhere. We've seen this happen uh, in various places in the, in the continent. So how do we monitor this? How do we very quickly understand uh, the, the, the speed at which a settlement is becoming a city in order to provide with all the facilities that will guarantee um, a healthy environment for the people working there. I think this is very important. It is under uh, researched. It's not uh, uh, the, the potential for using some of the techniques that I've talked about 
or uh, that Elaine has talked about before have not been um, realized yet, that, that the full potential, but I believe there is a lot to do in this area. There's a lot of other opportunities like monitoring um, how buildings, how uh, where, where people are building illegal settlements, for example, in areas where this should not happen because it's just dangerous, because it's close to certain mines or it's close to certain factories emitting uh, different kinds of uh, um, of gas or products or whatever. Um, so I think satellite imagery analysis holds a lot of potential in all these areas. But of course, there are other data sources uh, like social media and LN talked about this as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, we have one question. Um, the question is, um, have you considered other, apart from DNA in your model, incorporating environmental exposure covariates, and because they are, they are known to also influence the risk, um, especially for cross-species jumps. And uh, the built-in that same question is, have we also considered RNA signals in addition to DNA? So that's for Jeffrey. Gita, what I'd like to suggest is that um, we're already over time for our okay. Q&A session. What I'd like to suggest is that we take advantage of the very interactive breakout sessions that are coming in about three or in, in, in less than 10 minutes. Sure. And, and perhaps uh, that was Cecile Vibon uh, can maybe uh, ask that question to Jeffrey directly in that breakout session. Okay. There are also many other questions that were posed and we weren't able to answer all of them, but we will capture them and, and feel free, of course, to pose them again to the panelists in the breakout sessions. I'd like to uh, offer just a few concluding uh, remarks from my perspective uh, as, the, as the moderators. And first of all, to, to thank again, uh, Gita for serving with me as co-moderator and especially our panelists. Um, let me share my screen for just a moment before I turn it back over to Maggie and the, uh, and the KI team. I hope you can see what I've got here. And maybe uh, just to, I, I took several notes as we went through. I don't have time to recap all the notes, uh, but I, I wanted to share with you uh, perhaps this one slide. And it, it kind of comes up from the questions that we've already heard today that data science, to find the perfect data scientist who has great skills in communication and mathematics and statistics, including probability theory in programming and IT, as well as business or domain expertise, that's a unicorn. And maybe our panelists are those unicorns, but I think that for most of us, it's going to take a team. It's an interdisciplinary approach. And there's roles for machine learning scientists, data analysts, data engineers, and that this, this term data science is a very broad term and still not entirely defined. Uh, let's remember that data science is science, but it's an applied science, one that is designed to take data and turn it into value, meaning conclusions, discoveries, inventions, and especially when we use machine learning, predictive and descriptive models, as we've seen today. Models that describe DNA or chicken disease or human health. So again, thanks to our panelists. I invite you to, as we go into this Q&A session, to think about maybe some of these ideas. What are the challenges or barriers to uh, how can we build a community that incorporates all these disciplines? Uh, which applications or techniques have the greatest potential to impact uh, human health and well being in Africa and why? So these are questions I invite you to, to think about as we talk to our panelists in the breakout session, which Maggie will now explain. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I want to thank you very much, Daryl and Gita, and all of the panelists 
for a very rich discussion. And to the panelists and the moderators, you may want to go now to the breakout rooms to get ready for the interactive session. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will invite all of you to continue the conversation by joining the interactive session, but not yet. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. A few things first. Um, in the chat, you will find a link that goes to a, um, a, to a, uh, a, an exit poll. And we would really love it if you would take some time to fill it out. I have it here also on the slide, but you should be able to click on the link and give us some feedback about the session. Let us know how it worked for you. It really helps us as we plan future sessions to know um, how you felt about this one. So please, if you would, I'm gonna give you a few moments now. It only takes about 20 seconds to fill it out. Only a few questions, but very useful questions for us. Um, so I think it should be this link. If not, maybe Joe, you could correct the one that's in the, in the chat to make sure that it is that feedback. Um, in the meantime, I'll give you some time to fill that out, please, if you would. In a moment, I will also give you instructions. I'll demonstrate for you how you can join the breakout sessions. We have three sessions. They are based on themes that will allow you to have some conversations with each other. And before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of information about what's coming up next. Okay. We have some more sessions on this a state of data science series. We have approaches to maternal and child health. We also have data science to fight COVID-19 and a session on health metrics, measuring mapping and monitoring morbidity and mortality at all sorts of levels in Africa. These are coming up in uh, next weeks. There's one a week, one on October 7th, one on October 14th and one on October 21st. I hope that you will join us for those. As well, I just want to reiterate that if you're interested in learning more about the funding opportunities, please go to the NIH DSI Africa site. That's the Common Fund site. Uh, remember those dates and you can look around, poke around on KaiStorm to learn anything else that you might need to learn. Um, there is an interactive session coming up soon and I'm just about to tell you how you can get to that. Um, is everybody ready to learn about that? Have you had a chance to fill out the poll? Then let me share my screen again. And this time I'm going to take you to KaiStorm. This is how you got here. In fact, this is the very page that you came to in order to join this session. Uh, it is the biomedical informatics page. If you scroll down, you will see that automatically a few virtual post-it notes have appeared. And on each virtual post-it note, there is a theme. And each theme is a topic that will be discussed in that breakout room. So there's a breakout room on development, therapeutics, and diagnostics. There's one on enhancing existing techniques and another one on data standards, harmonization, and data quality. So just to let you know, the panelists will be in these rooms so you can ask them questions. I'll tell you in a moment who's going to start where, but I want you to know that it's not so much a breakout session for the panelist as it is an opportunity to have a discussion with the panelists and other experts from the National Institutes of Health around this subject matter. But to begin with, Drs. Abdullahi Banir Diallo and Dr. Jeffrey Siwo, and also our, one of our co-moderators, Dr. Geetha Sentil, will be in data standards, this one here. And Drs. Elaine Soisi and Mustafa Sisse will be in enhancing existing techniques. And Dr. Dina Mashube and also Dr. Daryl Hurt, our co-moderator, will be in development therapeutics and diagnostics. And of course, if you get lost or you're confused, or you don't understand what to do, you can always go into this one. The way it works is you see each one of these has its own Zoom room. So before we finish today, when you leave this Zoom room, when you leave this webinar, you can go back to this page. It should be on your browser because I think you used it to get here, but if not, you want to go to the Wednesday, 30th September Biomedical Informatics page, and you'll see it, and then you click through the Zoom room, and that's how you can join the conversation. What's important to know is um, if you go to a conversation and you want to leave and go to another one because you're curious about that topic too, it's perfectly fine. 
those panelists will be in those sessions, at least at the beginning, maybe for the first 10 or 15 minutes. They may stay for the whole time, but they might also be interested in another topic and leave too. So if you want to talk to one of those panelists in particular, please go to the session that I mentioned earlier. You can leave and go between the different Zoom rooms as you need. I think with that, um, I'm ready to say thank you to, again, the panelists and the moderators, to all of you for being here with us. Those sessions are going to last about 30 minutes. At the end of the 30 minutes, you can continue by going into our network lounge. If you have any questions, go to the help. Thank you for the exit poll. If you haven't done it yet, it's still in the chat. Please do it. Hope to see you at future sessions in the weeks coming and in the breakout sessions coming next. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.